Welcome back once again. We find our protagonist here in the base of Hyde's Tower of Flame as we're preparing to make our way just a little bit further into the level in order to make our way into No Man's Wharf a little bit later on. Still a bunch of old knights for me to slaughter my way through, so I'm not getting rid of the craftsman hammer just yet. But know that it is out the door as soon as we get out of this area. As I said before, I don't want to be reusing the weapon from last playthrough, so I'll, I will be switching that up. You've already seen me be using the great sword, so should be a little bit more interesting once I've finished this area. But again, it's a matter of this area is made for the craftsman hammer. There's just no other weapon that you should be clearing this with. It is the absolute creme de la creme, and there just no two ways about it. It's going to do you right. Come on around, and th there's just a few old knights to mop up. If you're fast enough, you can kill them without getting the trade hits, but eh, whatever. It's not like there's any real threats along this path before the next bonfire, so... I can take as many trade hits as I want and assist after each one of them and I'd still be fine by the time I reach No Man's Wharf. A little bit of a long elevator and looking at it now I, I kinda do wanna get rid of this Crimson Parma as well just because the red kind of is really striking in comparison to all the muted colors for the rest of the build so I don't quite think it's gonna be the small shield of choice for me either but I just I can't stand the small leather shield, so it'll be what I'm using until I find something else to substitute. I'd really been hoping that the blue shield that you get in the Force of Fallen Giants would have been a nice substitute, but it's technically a regular shield, so no dice. That should be the last of the old knights, and now we can use the bastard sword to face all our enemies from here on in. Something to think about is why precisely the old Iron King was creating what looked to be old knights with similar weaponry. They are incredibly massive in comparison to these old knights, so we know they're of a different sort, but they were functioning as some of the elevators and even just some of the set pieces down in the foyer of Broom Tower, and it, it really heavily looks like they were being manufactured there. I can't say for sure one way or another, but that's certainly what it looked to be going on. Um, as someone brought up over on Reddit, uh, it, we know for a fact that those aren't actually the same old knights and we can know this because the old iron king of course would be using iron to create old knights that's kind of his whole shtick and iron actually rusts with a brownish red hue whereas the old knights that can be found in hide patina with a very green corroded look which is indicative of copper in the alloy used to make whatever metal their armor is. So it, it is definitely canon that they are not created by the old Iron King. I mean, even if you don't want to think about it from a science sort of standpoint, considering this is a fantasy setting, you can at least note the massive difference in size and the complete absence of any regularly sized old knights. One second. So that is pretty much a I saw the sign as we're gonna get that the old knights were not the creation of the old Iron King but rather a mimicry of his especially because we know that Hyde was a kingdom long long ago probably destroyed or at least beginning to sink into the waves by the time the old Iron King was in power though we can't be certain some bits of the timeline are a bit off. To be perfectly clear, we can really say very little aside from the fact that there was 
nothing before the first Age of Fire in Lordran, and other than that, it there there's just so many different ways to interpret the evidence. There are some certain standard little set bits of the timeline that we can know for certain, but they are few and far between. A lot of it's just left up to very speculative words like eons past or a great deal of time later, or even not connected at all, and only connected by the surrounding storylines. Such as we know that two kingdoms were connected, and we know that one of those kingdoms was from long, long ago. Thus, we can conclude that the other kingdom was also from long, long ago. However, it's not quite perfect since kingdoms don't start and stop at the same time necessarily. There can be some overlap and differences between the two. So, it's just a very difficult little conundrum to puzzle out. One second. Sorry about that little interruption. Real life kind of got in the way. But I'm back, and it's not like I miss much. These guys are admittedly one of the more heinous enemies in the game. As you all know from the first time, I absolutely hate facing them, but they're not giving me too much of a struggle right now. And I'm getting pretty consistent backstabs, so it should be okay. Come on in through here, because I do want to get Gavlan on this playthrough, beca especially because of the... oh goodness, that's a lot of damage, I like it. Especially because of the emphasis on consumables I intend to place. Not to mention I want to have poison arrows, because I think that would be a really nice addition to the build. Any sort of range damage isn't something that I usually play with, but I'm certainly looking for it in this build. There we have it. I actually found someone who didn't even know that these guys could be backstabbed just the other day, and they were really surprised and kind of thankful that they got to see that. It's always funny for me looking through the eyes of a newer player, seeing what they aren't necessarily aware of and what they still have yet to be acquainted with. Given that I've spent so much time with Dark Souls 1 and here in Dark Souls 2, just the idea of that ignorance, even just from the perspective of they have yet to be acquainted with the knowledge. It's so foreign to me because I've spent so much time with these games and had so much time spent thinking about and learning them backwards, forwards, and sideways. Frangin leggings, those might look good with the whole wanderer look. But I'm not gonna bother managing my fashion souls just yet. I wanna get a few more pieces before I can actually set some, uh, set up a really nice look that'll carry me for a little while until I get something better. So, gonna be holding off on that. Some nice fire arrows, just in case I want to dip into that. Can be extremely useful in certain areas of the game. Specifically the gutter, which is coming up next. God, I'm really not looking forward to that. Oh. Can I get the punching attack? I can. Beautiful. The Bastard Sword is especially good for taking out enemies like this next Crystal Lizard because it has that very vertical forward attack that they can't run away from. And that large Titanite is going to be what allows me to get it all the way to plus six. And I know there's at least one Titanite chunk down in the gutter, so it should be plus seven before too long. I'm still debating with myself over whether I want to go to the gutter or uh, the lost sinner first. Do I not have any projectiles besides my throwing knives, really? Let's just see if I can outrange it. Oh, it's going to be dicey. 
Do I have a bigger weapon? I do. I do have the great sword. Or the old knight halberd. That's, that works fine, too. There we go. It's a complete worthless weapon, but it serves me well. That's... It's all part of adapting to your circumstance and using the tools you have at your own disposal. Mm, come on. This is going to be another large Titanite that's going to allow me to get whatever weapon I also pick up down in the gutter to plus four at the very least. Probably going to be the Bandit Great Axe, but if I can get Dark Spirit Melinda to drop her own Great Axe, I'm definitely going to go with that instead. I think it's a really nice drop for early game, and because it's raw, it'll have really nice damage, even though I haven't spent too many points really maxing out my combat stats yet. Admittedly, strength, the main dominant stat in that, has been upgraded already. Oh, the Varangian Sword. If I was going with a lighter build, I would just absolutely love that drop. I am a big fan of the Vivrangian sword just because it's the most damaging straight sword you can really obtain in the game. And the fact that it's a wonderful quality weapon works really nicely as well with the build that I'm currently running. Sadly, it's not classed as a great weapon, so... Hmm, can't really go with that. Doesn't fit the build. I am looking for these guys to drop the Sibo if at all possible, but I don't have my fingers crossed. It's a very rare drop at the best of times, and with all the extra loot that they can drop, I've, I I don't really expect anything out of it. I do... I am hoping to get a Varangian shield, which would be a perfect small shield substitute to this really crap-looking Crimson Parma, and it looks a lot better than the small leather shield, so it's it's basically ideal for me at this point. <clears throat> That's something that I'm definitely looking to be grabbing. And there are seven more Varangians left in the level, so I've I've got a decent chance. It's nothing's ever a guarantee, but I can certainly hope and you know, considering I'm actually gonna pop a rusted coin before I fight the next encounters. That way I can just maximize my chance of getting something decent. I very rarely pop these rusted coins in the game itself, but I am going for a consumable run, and I definitely need the buff if I'm going to reliably get anything from these guys, so let's do it. Already a no-go thus far. Did I happen to aggro those monsters? I did not. That's good to see. Come on. Come on up. I'm not going to hurt you much. That's you, and you get a drop. Nice. That's you. Oh, how nice of you. So I could switch fully to the Varangian set. At this point, I have the leggings and armor. But I don't know just yet. I am still looking to see what else I can get. Still really hoping for that shield and really hoping for the bow, so... This next encounter is really going to tell me whether I get anything nice at all. Come on up. Once again, the idea is to immediately sprint on up here, take out the archer, and then manipulate how these two aggro at you in order to face them one at a time. Oh, that was bad. Too predictive. Nope, 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 nope. Ouch. I failed to aggro them properly. I failed to get the predictive attack. It completely whiffed, and I was slaughtered by a pair of Varangians. I have brought shame upon my family name. There we go. Let's try that again. And this time, I'll actually pop the rust coin as I clear my way through the shortcut into the little last stretch there. That'll give me the maximum chance possible of getting a Varangi drop that I'm actually looking for. <sighs> oh, goodness. Come on around. Once I've cleared these two hollows, I'm going to pop it and start killing Varangians. There we have it. Once more onto the breach. Rest iron corn. Coin and... 
Now I'm on the clock. I want to be doing this as fast as possible to keep the buff going for as long as possible because it's most useful in the final boat encounter because there's actually four Varangians right in a little cluster that I can kill all at once. That's a nice prediction hit. Kill him so he's not plinking away at me. Don't bother going into the water because it will slow you down. Oh, I got too close. No, and that, then I went for slow attacks. Why would I do that? He's not going to be able to follow me fast enough, so I can just ignore him. Come on up. Mm. This is... This could possibly be a waste of time, or it could possibly be the best use of my time. We're going to have to find out. As to sign up before I fa come on over here to face this guy and his dog. Ow. Lock on fail. Well, the dog gave me a drop. That's nice of him. Just a soul. That's sad. I am going to want to come down and head to the shortcut the, quote, proper direction because there's several Varangians downstairs that I want to make sure I take care of. Come on. Come on. I hate the dog's hitboxes. More iron arrows. That's a little bit of a disappointment. Nothing to be done about that. Really? They're waking up already? There we go. That's two of them down. And you look to be another easy kill. Let's grab the drop before I head on. Just more leggings. That's no good. I don't have a good handle on exactly how long the rusted coin lasts, but I'm hoping it lasts a little bit longer. Specifically long enough for me to clear all these Varangians up here. Since these are all archers, they've got a nice chance to drop the sea bow. Only the cuffs? That's no good. Mm. Honestly, the scimitar wielders have nothing to drop for me since they have no shield and they have no bow, so they're basically just a waste of time. But these guys all have the shield with them, so fingers crossed again. That's you down, no drop. That's you down, still no drop. Not nice. Not nice at all. Oh, that's a scimitar wielder. Didn't recall. Now I can grab my souls and hopefully show you how to do that encounter properly this time. It does look like the uh, rusted coin is still in effect, so that's heartening. As I said, I'm, I'm really unacquainted with how long it lasts, so I'm basically just hoping that it's going to be long enough for me to kill all these guys. No, 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 no. Yeah. Stupid hitbox, but I'll take it. No, no, no. Why didn't he turn? He didn't turn. Why would he not turn? I said I was going to do that encounter properly, but I lied. Uh, okay, we're doing this one more time, and we're changing it up again in that we're going to sacrifice a little bit of fashion souls. It's going to hurt, but measures must be taken to get rid of this shield and to hopefully get me one of those delicious sea bows. They're perfect quality bows, extremely long range, great for sniping. Their only downside is that they take a lot of stamina for each shot. That being said, they're still one of the best bows in the game because of their range and the fact that they have CC scaling right off the bat. Most bows are heavily focused into decks, with the notable exceptions being the Dragon Rider, Composite, Bellkeeper, and Sibo. The Sibo is the only one we can really feasibly get, and the Dragon Rider one is focused on Int as well, to a greater degree. There we go. Not to mention the Composite Bow can't be garnered until at least Ornifex, and it's very, very short range, so suboptimal. Did I pop a Rusted Coin? I did not, so that's been less than ideal for these first few enemies killed, but most of them are pretty worthless. Mm. He's, he's just gonna waste my time. No worries. 
I suppose he actually has a chance of dropping the foot soldier's shield, now that I think about it. So maybe it is worth my time to kill him. More Varangian armor. Would you stop that? What do we have here? Just iron arrows. That's the worst drop possible. Just makes you feel like crap, because you know that you're probably never going to use them, and even then it'd just be better to buy more of your own. Oh, God, stop. Their combo capacity here is just so great. I really prefer to have a broad swing weapon or a quick thrust weapon versus these guys, but no such luck. Ugh, and they get the proc on the oil. That's pretty terrible. Geez, this, this place is just really not doing me any favors right now. It could be the build, but I think it's just the fact that I'm trying to rush through it and it's really messing me up. Come on. There we go. Honestly, this weapon is probably not ideal for clearing this, and I'm sticking with it anyways. I've already given up a little bit of fashion souls. You can't take away my greatsword. But you can keep your drops away from me, because you're horrible, horrible, evil Varangians, and you just hate people in general. Great. That's you taken out. This should be, hopefully, my last time clearing through this. I'm going to take a little side route just to kill these two Varangians over here, and the, just the, the barest hope that it'll pay off. That didn't work. And I'm poisoned. God, there's just so much going wrong. I don't even have any poison moss for that. I have to actually use the monastery charm. Using the monastery charm when you're basically at full health is just such a terrible waste. Uh, there we go. Nothing. There we go. Nothing. I'm not going to kill the scimitar wielder because, of course, he'll have nothing for me. He can't drop the shield nor the bow. So that brings us once more to this encounter that I swear I'm going to do right this time. I'm going to try and use the rolling attack in order to take them out properly. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. allows me to get the best prediction possible, and it comes out for the one-shot. Came in with a plan, executed the plan, and they're all stingy as hell. Humbug. That's really disappointing, though it does set me up with a lot of extra souls. Grr. Oh well. Here we are with the Flexile Sentry. Wasting his time in the early game. Honestly, without ads, this fight's a complete joke. It's so scripted and slow that you you honestly can avoid most of his hits just by walking. I don't believe he can be parried, but I am not going to be quoted on that. I think that his scimitar side, the arc sword side, might be able to be parried, but almost certainly not the clubs. Generally speaking, if an opponent is wielding two weapons, you probably don't want to parry them in the first place, considering they're going to overswing a lot and you can just circle around behind them. But uh, that's how that encounter goes down. I'm not going to be able to use this Pyromancy Flame for anything important until really late game, so I don't need to bother getting Carillion for those early upgrades. I can just wait till I get Rosabeth and handle it that way. You know, I'm looking at the time and thinking that I've got just about enough to clear my full way onto the Lost Sinner rather than starting up the gutter. Lost Sinner will also give me enough souls to buy the Silver Cat Ring, and hopefully everything should go great from there. That's going to be the plan for the rest of the episode. Touch that. Something weird that I always 
notice and kind of just have to look at every time is the actual cross guard on this bastard sword. It's got those weird notches in it. I don't know whether that's supposed to be some sort of textured look or actually just be notches, but it, it, it looks like the side of a coin, honestly. Like, if you pick up a quarter and look at the side, it's got those same little knurling lines, whatever they may be. It's just something that I wonder about. Like, it's clearly intentional, but what is it and why? Don't rightly know, and something that I don't like about the game is how horribly beaten up a lot of the weapons look even before they're broken. Even before they have any durability damage. They've still got scratches, nicks, cuts, dings on them all over the place. It, it fits thematically, but I would like to have a good looking weapon before I destroy it by cleaving through the skulls of my enemies. That's just my own personal stance on the matter. This next Tide Knight can be a little bit of a difficult one if you're well, depending upon your build, but if you can actually manage to parry him, it can be quite easy to do away with him. He sets himself up for parries a lot of the time because his combo is so consistent and straightforward, not to mention parries have such a large range of, from which you can parry them, so that's just another bonus. <clears throat> Comes out so fast. Nope. Ugh. God damn it. Everything seems to be killing me today. It's it's like I've never played this game before. What happened there was I parried when he was going for a wind-up attack rather than his regular straightforward thrust, so I got a little bit caught out. And then he had a little bit of a delay after I could escape his combo, which meant that I took the hit even though I was rolling. It does beggar the question of whether or not I could have gotten through that if I'd have had some adaptability, but I guess we'll just never know. This time I'll play it a little bit safer, take the backstab and not get greedy with it. Maybe a single hit afterwards, but... Oh no, 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 this is not what I wanted. This is not at all what I... Oh, the... the uh. The delay attack, again, imminent frustration, visions of sadness ahead, goodness, I am just really not playing it right today, I'm gonna, after this, after this recording, I'm gonna give myself a little break, make sure I don't have to subject you guys to any more of this in the next episode. Because I do, since I've been limiting myself to shorter recordings. I actually take the time to make multiples at once, but probably not going to keep that up. I seem to be on tilt for whatever reason. I don't, I'm still not sure how my character thought I wanted to do a follow-up swing. Would a jumping attack stagger it? Will? Let's dance around. Oh, he has the ranged advantage. But he's stuck. Come on, come on, give me the backstab. There we go. Game, set, match. Grab your spear, even though I'm never going to use it. At this point, it's a matter of domination. I killed you. Give me your friggin' spear. Gosh. Oh, well. We'll still be clearing on at a pretty nice clip. I can... Kill these guys, no problem, and I should be able to fully clear these secrets and be able to head right on through to the boss once I actually head up to the servant's quarters. I've got the wonderful antiquated key that allows me to sneak in the back way, and that makes this whole run extremely worthwhile, since you can either head right on to the boss and clear these secrets from the uh, Servant's Quarters bonfire, or you can clear all the secrets and just head straight to the boss from the Servant's Quarter bonfire. It's, it's basically the same path, because the level can't be cleared all at once, since the secret path 
branches out and dumps you off right back at the start of the area here at McDuff's Bonfire. And so, there, since there's no way back, really, other than just going through the level again, it's easier just to clear through and then Homeward Bone back and warp on over. That's the best way you can really handle the scenario. I am looking forward to killing the, uh, whatchamacallum, unstable hollows in the cage over there, since they actually will give me the Wanderer set, which will probably look really nice with certain other bits of armor to create a really vagabond look. Uh, it's very nostalgic for me as well, just because it is one of my favorite armor sets from Dark Souls 1, so I like to pick it up whenever I can, even if I know that I'm probably not going to be using it on a certain character. Toss that down there, and here we are. Swing, and triple kill. That's what's so great about those guys and having a sweeping weapon is that they have 80 health, pretty much on the dot, so anything you do to them is going to kill them. If you have a sweeping weapon, like this here great sword, you're going to kill them. It's just going to happen. Oh, and I get the one-hit kill on the archer. What? I don't like the follow-up swing on the strong attack, but you can play around it if you know what you're doing. Here we are. I Do I have fire bombs? I'm pretty sure I don't. No, I do have a flame butterfly, but that's probably a poor idea. But I want the shield just in case, so... Let's get the fire longsword out here. There we go. Get my little secret loot, and I can be happy. Get rid of that again. Do I have any better rings? I don't. I was looking, but it would seem not. This actually gives me a nice little chance to talk about Pharos himself. Pharos is the man who actually created the Lockstone contraptions. However, when people found how useful they were, they actually started co-opting the design, and so it's uncertain whether or not every single Pharos Lockstone contraption out there was actually created by the same man. It would seem that after a time it was just a thing that people started implementing in order to help travelers and whatnot. If I could have any... No, that was my only lockstone for the moment, but I can head back to Malentia and actually read up on that. And there's a lot more on Pharos in the Rat Covenant and some of the dialogues you can get there that really, really solidify who... Faros is as a character because he actually does show up in the game even if he's not actually called as much by name when you meet and then kill him but I'll talk about that a little bit later when the time comes suffice it to say Faros is one of my favorite characters in the lore just because he is one of the ones that I think FromSoft really did right they did a lot of Failed dialogues, secret little bits of information here and there. It's a lot of subterfuge and a lot of misdirection, but they definitely give you enough to make some really solid conclusions about Faros, who he was, what he is, and where his place in the story lies. They don't really give you a lot about his origins, but aside from that, there's, there's quite a lot of story for him, and that's kind of what really brings him as one of my out as one of my favorite characters of the lore is that he actually has so much on him. They they give him a full storyline. They give him little bits of dialogues that refer to him and really explain his story. Whereas a lot of the times in Dark Souls 2 with the lore, I found that while they there is an established story they do a terrible job of giving it to you. They're very, very bad at really explaining what's going on, giving you reasons for why what's going on is going on, and 
how exactly all the characters fit within it. Like, there's very, very little on characters like the prince and princess of Ven and Alkin, uh, Mitha, the baneful queen, just has a few little tidbits here and there that really tantalize you about her character, but don't give you anything solid to go off of. It's, it's very frustrating. That being said, Pharos is the one of the best characters, really, that they give you for lore in Dark Souls 2. Even better than Aldia, because they actually gave you a finite conclusion. You actually get to see him in game. There's, it's no big up-in-the-air thing of, is he a dragon? Did he die? Is he somewhere out in the world? He's just disappeared, I guess. Pharos we actually get to meet and dispatch, and that sense of finality really adds something to his arc. It, it gives you a full story rather than a nice prompt, I guess is the best way of describing it. Because while Aldia is just my absolute favorite character, I, I do admit that there isn't enough to go off of. We just can't know for certain one way or another because we haven't been given enough by From Software. Come on out. I'm considering whether or not I would use the Demon Great Machete, should they drop that. But I, I don't think that it would be a very good weapon. In fact, I know for certain it's not a good weapon, but while it would kind of fit with the build with a very ramshackle, great weapon type affair, I, I think that I would just forego it simply for the fact that its moveset's so god-awful and it's it's really got poor damage for its stats. It weighs a ton, has really bad moveset, and the damage is pretty lackluster as well. It is definitely one of the weapons that I would say is relegated solely to a joke playthrough or extremely dedicated fashion souls. If you wanted to play some sort of big time warden, then you would kind of be forced into using it, but honestly, you'd probably just find yourself using your Pyromancy Flame over and over and over again, because it's just infinitely more viable. Here we are. This little ambush, as I've said, is basically just a waste of time, but I get why it's there for the new players. A lot of the times, I can appreciate the design, even if I realize that it's no longer for me as a player, because I've spent so much time and figured out all the ins, outs, and side bits about the game. Most of the actual design elements are for new players and manipulating the player as they're going through basically blind. You can see that a lot more if you take a look at my little excursion into the broom tower. How I was making a lot of comments on how they introduce mechanics and what they're actually doing with the enemies one at a time, showing you how they're all different, how they work, and how you're supposed to deal with them. Like the first time you deal with one of the little hatches that can drop you down to the room below, they give you that with one of those barrel-wielding hollows that runs away from you right in front of it, so if you approach it all, it falls down the chute first, and shows you that, oh, this is a trap, this little mechanism here is going to drop you into the room below, be sure you know what you get, you're getting yourself into. And some of them are actually a little bit uh, very obscure in how they actually give you what you're supposed to do with the, with the area. Uh, the example that comes to mind is the one firebomb lobbing soldier who's hidden behind a door locked from the inside that you actually have to blow up with a fire or firebomb in order to get inside since the explosive barrels are actually blocking the door. It's a very tricky way of hiding him away but at the same time it's something possible from the very outset, something you can figure out and used to clear through the area with a little bit of an advantage since there's no longer going to be that firebomb hollow just chucking away at you while you're trying to face the 
just mob of enemies within. Since I'm only at four Estus, because I haven't stopped at Majula, because I'm being risky and trying to cut down on time, I'm going to save as much Estus as possible for the actual boss fight, even though I'm still probably not going to use all of it. I do have to clear around in here as well, so that's just extra chances for failure. Let's just get some regular hits off. No! Oh, goodness. That is the one time I am thankful for de the delay on that attack. Because usually, the delay means that you roll too early and get snagged by it anyways. But this one instance, this one time, it meant that I could regenerate the stamina I needed to swing again. Before. Oh, come on. Play nice. There we go. That's what I was looking for. That's a kill shot. Pretty sure that it takes a hit and a backstab, but that's no big deal. I am really hoping to get the Bellkeeper bow now, since it takes a little bit more stamina than the sea bow, but it's still a really good quality bow. And they just really, really don't want to give me anything. Even the Bellkeeper shield would be nice, because it's a small shield that looks very similar to the foot soldier shield. Basically, any of their usual drops that I'd consider crappy would be incredibly welcome, and... No, not even a malformed skull. Something is just terrible about my luck today. Come on around. I always fully clear the hollows in here just because it's so easy since they drop in a single hit, and I've memorized all their locations. It also produces the risk factor for heading down the and grabbing the lever and not the lever, but the pole switch in order to get the get to the next area. So any way that I can reduce risk is something that I want to be doing before putting myself in a risky situation. And in fact, if you clear all of them, it's actually a no risk situation. Got all seven or eight? I believe there's eight. Let me check. There's four here on the ground. No, there's there's actually five here in the cells. One before the stairs and the two above the stairs. So yeah, there's there's eight in total. And once you've cleared all of them, you can head right on through. Once again, gonna life gem it up. Make sure that I have as much Estus as possible and health possible for the fight. And I'm definitely gonna be using an aromatic ooze. Any extra damage I can get is going to be really useful. Also, now I get to show off parrying again. Just because... Uh, maybe I shouldn't. Just because it is a very high risk, very little reward, little maneuver to be pulling, but uh, it's so satisfying to pull off. I really want to... No, it rolled too early, my own fault. Yes! Look how quickly she gets away, though. It's worthless. Oh, no, 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 no. I wanted a regular attack. Like this. Yeah! <laughs> Loving it. Loving it. Come on. Come on. There we go. Spade her into those attacks. Oh, so good. It, it really is satisfying. If you've... Oh, dear. If you've never parried a boss before, give it a shot sometime. You won't regret it. I mean, unless you die, because then, then you're probably going to regret it a lot. Which is actually likely to happen. I would recommend practicing your parrying before going in and trying it on a boss. Uh, the enemies that did it for me were the Drake Blood Knights down in Shulva. I was having such a terrible time clearing them with any consistency because of their infinite poise and really staggering combos that I found parrying them, even though I would take a hit or two in the process just trying to figure out the right timing, parrying them actually was the best way I could deal with them. It was the most consistent, it generally led to me losing the least amount of health in Estus, and it was really satisfying to pull off. As you saw in that boss fight there, I've kind of gotten a little bit better at it, especially with 
enemies with really long wind-ups but very consistent swings. It's an absolute dream, and if you do pull it off against a boss, you feel like an absolute badass. That's, that's not something to be underestimated. I mean, I know we're playing a game, but how you play the game is really important. I mean, you're, you're playing a game to have fun, right? Usually. I, I would say that I play games in order to have fun, and that's what Dark Souls does for me, so. Burn her soul. That's going to allow me to get my silver cat ring, as well as another level up. Probably should have done that first, but that's really nice because it allows me to get my vigor back up to an even stat number. I'm a little bit obsessive about that, but it's no big deal. And that's probably going to be it for the playthrough. Not the playthrough, but the episode. Do I ha I still don't have any better small shields. Gosh. Does the Iron Parma count as a small shield? I'll buy it. Just get rid of this terrible looking... Terrible, terrible looking crimson shield. It's, it's better than the... Than the small leather shield. But it's still not good looking. It's so stark. You know what? I'm going to check to see if the... Iron Parma is a small shield, and then I'm going to switch around some of my armor. Get myself a little bit more of a fashion souls going on. Buy item. It is a small shield. Give it here. It weighs three times as much as my... Oh, excuse me, as much as my current shield, but it's worth it. Just give me something. Okay. Now let's have a look-see. The imported tunic is probably going to be the best look... You know, the Wanderer's coat looks really nice. Definitely not the Brigand set. And, yeah, pretty much everything from that point on is going to be too heavy for what I'm looking at. So, let's see what I can do with the Wanderer's set. Prangian cuffs. Possibly nice. Let me get that out of there just so I can get a good look at the hands. Prangian's cuffs might be nice. Definitely not the Drang Lake set. Traveling Merchant Gloves look really good. The Wanderer's Manchettes obviously look pretty great. And the Imported Manchettes. Hmm. It's definitely between the Imported Manchettes and the Traveling Merchant Gloves, but I'm going to go with those. I think they look a little bit better. I'm going to check the Brigand Trousers. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the armor I'm going to be going with. I've got my Iron Parma to be pairing with. I can actually... is How good is... How does that rate? It is actually better than the other two shields in terms of blocking as well. So th that is something to note, I guess. It's, it's, it's a nice little feature, but that's honestly not what you should be doing with it. So it's probably not too big of a deal. And it just occurs to me that I'm going to have to strip all of this off at the beginning of next episode in order to survive the fall consistently. And so, just to make sure that I can heal all that right back up, I'm going to upgrade my Estus Foley, and that's going to be the episode. Don't want to drag it out too much longer. I did a, a lot of good stuff today. Cleared through No Man's Wharf, cleared through the full Bastille and Sinner's Rise, and showed that the Varangians and that the little Hyde Knight right there are horrible, horrible enemies that you should avoid at all costs unless you want to farm them for some reason. God, I, I still flustered. I will resume recording another time so that I can be sure I'm not going to go on tilt and have to deal with all this horrible, horrible stuff again. Because, really, it's just not been treating me right. There we go. And we're just about ready for next episode. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.